It is finished. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To suffer is to be human. And so also is it to make sense of that suffering. In human history, we have developed ingenious, often very sophisticated ways of doing so. The ancient Greeks, for example, chose to grasp suffering's nettle by plumbing its depths in extraordinary plays they called tragedies, in which a hero is doomed to ruin by some fatal flaw. Think of Oedipus's pride or Achilles' famous heel. These plays gave audiences the chance to meditate on the glory and the fragility of the human condition. The human condition that they shared with the hero. The Greeks' various schools of philosophy each had their own take on what to do with the suffering put so splendidly and horrifically on display in their tragedies. The Stoics, for example, famously suggesting that we come to terms with suffering's inevitability, accept it as a necessary part of our being human, and accept whatever suffering comes to us as our fate. Or the Epicureans enjoining us to minimize our suffering as much as we can by seeking pleasure and peace, and so on. Now, contemporary Americans, of course, are less likely to turn to Epicurus or Seneca for advice. They're more likely to rehearse something like, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Something like Nietzsche meets G.I. Joe. Or to appeal to the old British virtues of resilience and resignation ensconced in the wartime motto, keep calm and carry on. I'm concerned, though, that when confronted by suffering of the magnitude wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic, most of us have fallen back on a philosophy a whole lot flimsier even than these. It's the myth of the silver lining. A myth encapsulated in social media posts like those recently lampooned by the religious writer Kate Bowler, who in this past Sunday's Times said, if I see one more millionaire on Instagram yelling that she is choosing joy while selling journals in which moms are supposed to write joy mantras, I'm going to lose my mind. Amen. The silver lining, the impulse in each of us to find something good about everything. Something good about everything that excuses the pain or suffering something has caused. The silver lining is so tempting to us because it gives us relief from another sort of pain. The pain of grief, the pain of coming to terms with what it is we have suffered or lost. And I get it. We need relief these days, and we need it quickly. I know that I do. And by identifying something in the bad that counts as good, we can tap into the sweet relief of, okay, I guess it's not so bad after all. But that's what makes the myth of the silver lining so pernicious. It relieves our beleaguered psyches and souls by denying, at least partially, just how awful something is. The relief it gives us is a lie. Somewhat like trying to quench our thirst by drinking a sugary soft drink feels great for a second, and then awful later. Though it's an understandable impulse, and one that, to be clear, I share, it is also profoundly disrespectful of human suffering. 
as though the deaths of some 16,500 Americans and some 80,500 others worldwide as of this morning, those who have died from COVID-19 just so far, as though those deaths can be compensated for by the silver lining that, well, we're all spending more time with our families, aren't we? Or, well, at least I won't ever take that for granted again. But both of these things may very well be true, right? I think that they are true. They're certainly true in my life, and I'm grateful for them, and they are good. But they are not the silver linings of the pandemic. Pandemics don't have silver linings. They're awful, terrible reality. They're toll. They're seemingly unmeasurable human cost cannot be made any easier to digest by appealing to whatever good we might be experiencing in the midst of them. We need an account of suffering capable of saying this, capable of saying that this virus is awful and worthy of grief and that there are still some good things in our lives. Some of them even born somehow of our awful circumstances. We need an account of suffering capable of holding both of these together at the same time and in such a way that the good in no way excuses or alleviates or minimizes the bad. Fortunately for us, we have Holy Week. And this is exactly the kind of attitude towards suffering that Good Friday is intended to cultivate within us. Christianity is the religion of the resurrection, to be sure. But I believe it is a mistake to think that the story of Jesus is any less tragic than something penned by Sophocles or Shakespeare or Wagner. It is more tragic. More tragic because it is written and suffered by God. The version of the Passion Father Peter and I just read from St. John's Gospel is markedly different from the one we heard read on Sunday so beautifully by our, by our team of lectors. That one was from Matthew. As Father Peter mentioned on Sunday, in John, Jesus dies with complete dignity seemingly in total and utter control of the chaos swirling around him. It being the concern of John's gospel to pull back the curtain, as it were, on the earthly events as they happened in human history, to show us the divine action and intention which lay just behind them. John's Jesus dies upon declaring, it is finished. But I think we have to go back to Matthew in order to figure out what it was. There, as in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus dies not in control, but in a moment of unbelievable and horrifyingly human fear falling back on words from his own scripture, words that I think we can imagine Jesus learned at the knees of his parents, Mary and Joseph. He fell back on his Sunday school lessons, as it were, when faced with the tragedy of his life, using them to give voice to what he's feeling. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Theologians have speculated that the redemption wrought by Jesus on the cross results from the fact that in his death, Jesus freely takes on himself all the sin and the suffering of the whole human race. As our reading from the prophet Isaiah said, he has borne the iniquity of us all. Surely he has borne our grief and suffered our diseases. And in this moment, 
in Jesus' cry of God-forsakenness, I believe he was utterly overwhelmed by the weight he had come to carry. Having drunk to the dregs the horrible poison of sinful, sinful humanity's separation from God and all of the havoc and pain it brought in its wake. As Jesus took on the sin and suffering of the world, he entered into a, a kind of spiritual night. A spiritual night in which all subsequent dark nights of the soul mysteriously participate. It is as though Jesus' human awareness of his relationship with the one he knows as his Father is occluded its light eclipsed by the horrors, the genocides and untimely deaths and betrayals that he has taken up into himself. A darkness which is only made more awful, more impossible by the fact that this human being, Jesus, is also God, is also the eternal Son of the Father from whom he now feels forsaken. We really must imagine some great but dread-filled music to accompany our Lord's blood-curdling scream. His Godhead made even his fear sublime. God, forsaken by God. God, separated from God, God abandoned by God. This is what Jesus has finished. God's headlong plunge into the life of the world he created, a world which went disastrously haywire nearly the moment it began, but whose very rubble God loved so fiercely that he could not stand to fix it in any way that would do violence to it, which left God with only one option, to suffer ruin along with it. That's it. That's the story. God was dead, and we killed him. Christianity says all this is true. Full stop. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. But not before God died. Not before God's tragedy was played out to the end. Not before it was finished. Crucifixion gave way to resurrection. Horror to happy ending dramatically, as it were. That is, in the passage of time, by whatever happened in those 40 dread hours when God himself was interred in hell. The resurrection is not the crucifixion's silver lining. The resurrection is the crucifixion's reversal a divine insurgency against evil and death so stunning that it transformed the cross from an instrument of torture into a symbol of life and immortality, something we can kiss. These, the cross and the resurrection, are the grounds of Christian hope, and silver linings are the business of those who have given up on it. So I beg you, don't. Do not give up on our God. Do not lose heart. Don't rationalize the pandemic away. Let it be awful. Don't minimize it or trivialize it or your feelings about it. If you're scared, be scared. If you're angry, be angry. If you're bored, be bored. This pandemic is a cross borne by each and every one of us right now. 
whether we are ill ourselves with this or some other disease, or we are struggling to care for the sick or the elderly in shockingly precarious circumstances, or we are suffering from mental distress and isolation in our homes, or living in constant fear from being isolated in our homes with someone who has abused us, or are weighed down by financial stress, or are grieving the loss of loved ones, or beloved rituals, or lost opportunities. Let yourself have a bad day. Jesus had at least one. And then, ask God to use it. Ask God to join your bad day to his, your suffering to his. That by his inexhaustible majesty, ingenuity, and power, he might make something meaningful of your bad day as he did of Jesus's. Then, rather than silver linings, look for the signs of God's mercy. Those little joys, the phone calls, or letters, or walks, or music, or birds, or flowers, or sunshine, or games, or TV shows that are giving you the strength to carry on in the midst of the most devastating event to afflict the human race in our lifetimes. When we pray God to give us this day our daily bread, this is what we mean. Thank God for these things. They are signs of his providence, his merciful provision for us in the midst even of those afflictions which he mysteriously but we hope and trust wisely permit to befall us. Small mercies, like the fact that Jesus' mom and his aunt and Mary Magdalene and John stood next to him while he died on the cross. Or like the drink he was given when he was thirsty. These things do not take away our crosses but they do make them possible to bear. I am sorry for the ways that I know so many of you are suffering today. I believe that God is sorry too. God is real. He has not forsaken you nor will he ever. He knows where you are. He's been there. And he knows the end of your story. He knows that it has a happy ending. Even though there is a cross erected right in the middle of it. A cross just like his. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. He made even that awful Friday good. <laughs>